Hey everybody, it's Michael Waddell with another edition of Outdoor Bites. Greg Ritz, how what's are been you? going on, man? Good to see you. How you was too? your season? It was good, man. That's what I was going to ask you, man, because I know, I know you was chasing them. Oh, listen, I don't put as much bone on the ground now that you do. I'm not the bone collector. You're the bone collector. Man, I'm just building campfires and raising youngins <laughs> mostly. I'm having to hunt just to keep my kids fed now. Yeah. Oh my God, I hear you. Right on, man. What's, where where did all you go, man, hunt master? You know, I had a fantastic season. So I drew a tag, a coveted tag, yeah. in Maine for moose. Really? And I have not done a show from, obviously I live in New Hampshire, so I've not done anything in New England. And that, it was the highlight of the season and I never kill. Really? And it goes to show you a lot of people are out there, they, they put, their success on how big the antlers are or whether they tagged or didn't tag. And for me, it was that experience hunting in the big main woods. I mean, yeah. it's as remote as Alaska or British Columbia. Well, you know, a lot of people don't know it. Of course, you grew up where you did. You always knew that just a little north, you got some of the best moose hunting in the world. And that is a coveted tag. And um, what's funny about it, I'm sure in the back of your mind, you think if I can ever get a good tag up there, I'm probably gonna go up there and knock one down. Oh, no. and for that not to come you know, to fruition, that's pretty, Pretty crazy, but it's still, again, it's still an unbelievable opportunity. It is, it is, but it's, it, so I had that great opportunity, and obviously you slide down to the Midwest for whitetails, and I finished my season in Mexico. No way. With coos deer, which obviously is the smallest of the whitetail species, and I will tell you, if you have not done that, now you shot a world record uh, yeah, uh, whitetail uh, Carmen, species, Carmen, Carmen Mountain, Carmen Mountain, Mountain whitetail. whitetail. And it would have been actually cool if I'd have knew that that species existed. You know, <laughs> I, it was like this little deer come out and I shot it. I mean, it was a big rack. And, and so somebody later said, hey man, you know, it's a Carmen Mountain, it's pretty big. So anyway, that's, as a matter of fact, it's one of the only deer I got in, um, in the record books just because we thought it might be the worst. I think it ended up being like number two. But, oh my God. but you're right, those are tiny little deer. Yeah, so I, did you go all the way down to Sonora? I went all the way down to Sonora and I will tell you, I was not expecting to hunt them like sheep. Yeah. big, steep mountains, and I mean, it was, it was tough physically. Yeah. I mean, I knew going into it, I'm gonna need my optics, hunt them like mule deer and all that, but that was a, a fantastic experience. And I was with our folks from Hornady. You and oh, I yeah. share a lot of relationships over there. Neil so, and the uh, guys, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. So we, we, had a, we had a great time, but, but how about you? What big whitetails did you put on the ground? Man, the same old kind of run, went to, went to Kansas, Kentucky. Matter of fact, one of the first places I ever hunted Kentucky was, was a few years ago. Western Kentucky, but I was hunting down in that Muhlenberg County this year. So, and, and really kind of the highlight of what I'm doing right now is really staying around the house in Georgia. Yep. And all the kids, you know, got five kids, but seeing them growing up mm -hmm. and hunting at the farm. And uh, we got a little place we can cut up the deer and process the deer, so. But it's, it's yeah. about manage your own land now, right? Yeah. You feel more vested in the animal. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what I do on the whitetails. I don't do anything with outfitters because if I can't do it myself, and do the habitat improvement and feed the deer and, and watch them grow up. Like to me, they're they're part of me. I mean, I get all the way to the end of the season, right? All the way through gun season and that poor Leela Costco and I'm, ah, oh, that deer needs another year. Yeah. That deer needs another year. <laughs> exactly. That's what I did to my number one deer. I let him roll over and he's a yeah. 180 inch deer. Holy cow. And you know what's funny? You'll see him this year and you're like, okay, he's probably gonna be six and a half, seven, but I wonder what he'd be at eight. Exactly. <laughs> it, it becomes this, you, you can't help it. And then you, you know, it's you, like, why, and then you even lay and be like, why am I doing this? He's this is the biggest deer I, out there. I should probably go hunt him, you know. But but, it, but it's personal to us. And I think yeah. part of it for you and I and Lee and a lot of these other people here, uh, we don't want to close the chapter on that relationship. Yeah, Bigger, I agree. Because at, at that point, it's like, I, I know I can harvest you, but then I'm never going to see you again. Yeah. So I'm like, well. It's over. It's over. And I don't, I don't, I mean, this is my life. It is, it is, it is hard to balance that when it comes to even shooting our shows because Obviously, if you watch an episode of a hunt show, you know, you kind of want to see somebody kill a deer. However, the, the funnest part for me, and it sounds like this is for you, is the process of the food plots, the, yep. the seeing the land, even looking at the timber. You know, yeah. you know you're getting older and, and sentimental when you're out there looking at a sweet gum tree, like you so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're wondering, should I cut it down? You know, know, I, I just had, so I just had a, a, a logger, Bobby Kendall, who you may know, he's fantastic at uh, Whitetail Group with Habitat Management, but he's got a logging company. And we're going through looking at the trees and we come up to this big, uh, this big black oak, right? Yeah. And I'm sitting there looking at this tree, go, man, I can put a tree stand on that. And uh, so I said, how much do you think I could get for that tree? He goes, well, you know, based off of this and you're splitting all that. He said, oh, maybe about $50 for 50 bucks, leave that tree. Leave it. <laughs> I know, it's funny. Um, you know, now, and you do a lot on Huntmasters, like hinge cut and proper yeah. bed and habitat. 
man, me and my dad went to go do some hinge cut the other day, and I was getting all sentimental. I was almost in tears in my eyes, like, man, I don't even want to cut you. You know, it's oh, like, it, it's just, it's, it's amazing. But I think that's what comes with being a landowner, and you become a, it's a different steward. It's not like you're just so worried about getting a tag on something. Exactly. You're more excited about just getting out there and putting sweat into it, laying something out better. You and, know? and doing it with my kids. Yes. Right, so I, I had a great dad moment this year. So my oldest daughter, Sydney, so she hunted earlier in the season with me. She came back out after Christmas and uh, doing the school online. She's like, okay, dad, I'll, like, I'll work online so I can hunt with you. And uh, it was tough, weather was tough. And uh, I'm like, hey, honey, I gotta go to ATA show. Yeah. And she looks at me and she goes, okay. And I'm like, no, like I have to leave. And she goes, dad, I'm 20 years old. And I've been on this farm for over 10 years. I know every trail, every tree stand, every blind location. Yeah. I got this. Oh, yeah, leave me alone. Leave I got me alone. It. So I'm at ATA, like, okay, honey, what do you, where, you know, where are you gonna, where are you gonna go tonight and all this? You know, she, her response to me was, what? Where would you go on a southeast wind? <laughs> she, th she threw that over she, her psych not she, psychology on you, like. She did. I'm like, all right, you got this. Yeah. So those experiences to me. Are, are priceless, better than 200 inch whitetails hunting with my kids. Yeah, that's cool, man. It, it, that, that I will say is exciting and it's funny because our kids are similar in age. Same things happen to me. I, you know, it's like, and, and now I've learned to embrace it because you know, if you're a father and, and I still got Waylon who's six, but even Mason who's 22, my, I got McCoy who's 15 and Meyer who's 18, they'll mention going hunting and used to, I was like, hey, now you go check, you want to do this, this. Now I don't say anything, like I, I give them and they're just out hunting, and it's, 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 it makes me happy, but it's weird because I'm so used to saying, hey man, if I was y'all, if y'all turkey hunting, them turkeys gonna be gobbling down that bottom, you know, over by the church, and you might well, wanna- I know at ATA day. show this year, and anybody who's obviously followed you in your career, I mean, I remember when you would bring Mason to the shows and you'd hold his hands. Yep. He'd get a little older, and Mason, he'd be, he'd be right like a dog, right next to your, yep. your side hip. I saw Mason this trip, I'm like, well, he's over there, and I know why he's over here. Yeah. Like, he's completely on his own and confident. He's working. He's got his own responsibilities. You know, this morning, Mason and I had a quick breakfast, but when I left, he was uh, he was on a conference call. I'm like, I don't know. It's just kind of weird. And, uh, and and that is one thing that I've noticed. You know, we, we on the Outdoor Bites and talking to a lot of the show hosts and producers, the one thing I've noticed is uh, all of us gotten a lot more sentimental and a lot more nostalgic. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's a certain, certain piece. You know, we're getting a little older. You know, when we were first starting some of these shows, we were, I don't know, blowing and going, trying to trying to figure out what to do and what direction. But now it's just a certain security and, and a peace has come over all of us. No, no doubt. I came in the house the other day and my girls were all there. And I look on the television and I'm like, what are you guys watching, right? And they're like, we're watching my outdoor TV. Yeah. I'm like, why are you guys watching that? To see how young you used to look. I know, oh God. <laughs> They're yeah. like, you used to look like that and you had that and that bow looks so funny. And they, because they can sit there and go through the archives, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, both of us have a lot of seasons oh, loaded up on, on My Outdoor TV. And, and they just had a kick with their friends. Of course, they were also watching their shows when they were little. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's just become a lifestyle in the, in the family, just like yeah. with you and your dad and your kids. Yeah. I, I get asked a lot, like, where did I come up with Bone Collector? And I tell the story, you and I on the range at Thompson yeah. Center. Where did you come up with the name Hunt Masters? You know, that's it's interesting. So when we were doing the rebrand and kind of the uh, changing the storyline, and uh, obviously this goes back to the to sub seven days. We used to work with that yep. crew over there with uh, uh, Mark, Mark and Alex and, and, and those guys. And, uh, and I said, I don't want, I want a show that celebrates the guy, the outfitter, the indigenous people, right? The, the people in the community and not me. Mm -hmm. Because we're whiteboard and like, what do, you, what do you call the show? And I said, in the name uh, Hunt Masters came up because the name really, I'm not the Hunt Master. All I am is the Anthony Bourdain of the outdoors. I'm just telling somebody else's story. I got you. Whether yeah. that story is an animal's perspective or that story is, is a guest from Hornady or whether that story is a, you know, a pygmy or something that I'm hunting with. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's where that's where it came from is literally whiteboarding the concept of the show. It is no different than you and I on the range. That's like, right. Hey, it's like, hey, Michael, how do you like that? Man, I'm going to collect a lot of bone this year. Really? And I I'm like, that. collect I... a lot of bone. He said, yeah. He said, Sucker. this gun, this gun's the bone collector. And I saw that light go off well, in your head. I, I just told the story. We had a little interview and I just told the story. Somebody asked me, said, you know, where did bone collector is? And I said, it, Greg and I were shooting guns. And I said, Greg, Greg, we're looking at the options. He at the time owned and was running all the marketing and really all the executive stuff at Thompson Center. And 
the, the conversation came up about, you know, maybe doing a Michael Waddell of muzzleloader, yep. and I told him the story. And so it's, I remember that. I mean, I both look, looked at and then I called you when I got home. Yep. I said, hey, I might want to do a show on this. So it's I crazy. Mean, it, but that's the great part about this industry is, is the legacy that yeah. you can leave for other people. And there's so many good young kids coming up right now. And obviously, you know, with the digital platforms that are out there and the social media, you know, and obviously the strength of the linear TV, man, th this sport is it the healthiest condition I've seen in my career. I agree. I agree. I, th I think it's stronger, more secure. We've learned a lot, and I think we're going to keep going. And, Greg, continue success, man. Hey, I appreciate you. Yes, sir. I'll Thank see you, you in the field, buddy. We certainly hope you enjoyed Outdoor Bites with me, Michael Waddell. Thank you all for watching.